We're at the John Thompson Memorial Ling-a-Ding Tournament. John was an avid ling fisherman. The, he lived to get to fish this time of the year. Uh, he would have already been out there for weeks now just looking for a ling. Uh, he, it was his passion and he did it for years. I, I posted some pictures the other day on Facebook, 25 years apart, he's holding up two ling. It was always what he, it was his passion. He loved to come down here and, and uh, had a place here since 78 and that's why you know the family had a place here was for ling fishing. And uh, um, always we'd go out, uh, we worked together as a team. He, he made it a passion for me. He taught me how to ling fish. Uh, his largest fish, I think probably, was in the 80s. Uh, I've got some pictures of him where he actually won the Ling Ding tournament back in 87, which is pretty neat. He won it several times through the years. Um, and Nate, when, when John passed away, we talked about the Ling Ding and starting it back, and then uh, some other guys were already doing the tournament at that time. And so they decided not to do it, and Nate wanted to know, would it be okay if we did a John Thompson Memorial Ling Ding this year, which is wonderful. John would be so honored to have the Ling Ding you know, named after him because he fished the Ling Ding tournament for years back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we built a reef after John passed away in 2011. We, we built a reef out on Bell Shoals. Uh, that's where we always fished for Ling, was on Bell Shoals. We would, our, we would always run to the lumber ship and then just we had a path where he had marked all the the Mexico Beach Marine Mexico Beach Artificial Reef Association, all of the reefs out there. He would just kind of meander back and forth, and and through the years, oh my goodness, it's untold how many ling we caught on Bell Shoals. We caught ling on Bell Shoals before the reefs were out there because that was always where he loved to fish. Uh, he and Dave Mullis and Art Dillard, they would all kind of work the shoals together and and uh, catch ling and uh, we built the reef as uh, basically a forward ling fishing. Uh, the, leaf, the reef is about a quarter of a mile from the lumber ship which was again we always started the lumber ship and then worked down Bell Shoals and back. Uh, being a quarter of a mile from the lumber ship the, the placement of the reef is like we handpicked it. It could not have been any more handpicked where John would have been happy to know the reef was there. Uh, it was built We've added to it. It's built in 2012. Uh, we, I'm sorry, two, yeah, 2012. Uh, we did a live celebration for John in April of 2012, right after the reef was built, um, and we've added to it uh, in 2013. And then just last week, or this week, we added two, three more modules to it uh, for 2014. Uh, the tournament proceeds will a part of that will go to adding adding to the reef again and so our goal is to grow it and keep growing it uh, and just you know keep honoring John he loved to take kids fishing you know and John was selfish in his fishing um, he he always liked to see other people catch them and and so I guess that's why that video of that last ling I have when he caught it it's so priceless to me because he caught it but somebody on the boat he'd always let them catch them and he loved to run the boat and watch other people catch ling or any kind of fish you know but he loved to take kids fishing and that same day we uh, we came back in and Don and Cheryl Spillers were here with Trey and Amy and and uh, Trey had never caught a ling so we we took Trey out and and let him catch his first ling that same day. And I've got pictures of it, and it was always priceless to John because he loved Trey, and to let Trey catch his first ling was, was really exciting for him. But uh, he'd say start them young. So he loved kids and, and loved to take them out. And so having the reef so close in, you know, it's close enough for you know, to be able to take kids out and let them enjoy it too. So lots of life on the reef. Not just hoping this year somebody's going to catch a ling. So wish it would be me, <laughs> but uh, you know somebody will. I, I think somebody will get one this year. Uh, welcome to Bay County Outdoors uh, Shop Talk. This week we are here in Mexico Beach at Mexico Beach Marina. We're at the John Thompson Memorial oh. Ling a Ding Tournament. Um, we went out looking for ling today. Didn't find any ling, no. so we changed our game plan and we went looking for red, red grouper. grouper. Red grouper, yep. Um, didn't find any didn't amber jet. Didn't find any red grouper, but boy, we found a load of red snapper. And I have to ask you, is, is that normal here in Mexico Beach? That is very normal here. I mean, we see them on every trip we go on. I mean, they're plentiful. Um, 
near about any reef you stop on right here that we have them. <laughs> Whether it's four miles offshore or 40 oh. miles offshore, they're there. Woo, that's a pretty fish. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> about two hours, she's about, she's about two hours away from being 20 pounds. That's the story. Got that. It's been a while since I had a good tug. There we go. Well, there he is again. And it's. Boy, that's a beautiful fish. Be able to bring something like this up, you know, when you're not able to put it in the box. It just. So many of them. Another one goes free. I think that you guys are getting robbed of a resource is what I think. You know, everybody I talk to in the Gulf and uh, throughout the region is talking about how you're tripping over red snapper. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks of it as a state or a local problem, but it's really bound by a federal law. You know, I've got this, this red snapper population is growing and getting better, and you've got a better resource, yet this federal law and the lack of data collection at the federal side is is costing you a valuable resource. Right. And, you know, it's, it's strange for people to understand. We see this problem in other regions as well. You, you've got a red snapper population that's building really, really nicely, and you don't have access to it. We've got other folks in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic who have gone through the rebuilding process. We've lost a lot of business from folks going through the rebuilding. Now it's at a rebuilt status, and you still don't have access to it. Right. So it's really a shame. Yeah. I know it's, it's definitely hurt us as far as tourism, getting people down here. Short season, it's, it's, it's tore up the industry as far as our side of it and probably hotels and everything. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a, you're talking about a huge industry and a huge economic driver in this country. Right. Um, and a lot of folks, I'll tell you, folks outside of Florida, or a lot of folks, you look at the tourism commercials and everything that are run, and everybody thinks about these game fish and tarpon and, and snook. But, you know, red snapper, grouper, these are fish that just drive the economic, you know, engine in each of these towns. And we're here along the, uh, the Forgotten Coast and the Panhandle especially. It's, uh, it's, an important, it's an important fish for people coming down from Alabama or Georgia, spending their tourism dollars. They want to come out, they want to catch some fish, and they want to bring them home and eat them. Right. It's, a little bang for the it's not just a matter of going out and catching a couple of fish. The recreational fishermen in America are a huge economic force. You know, you're driving the economy, like you said it. Hotels, restaurants, people come to the shores, you know, to, to relax and they, they go to go fishing. It's right. a huge, huge lifestyle. It's one that's, we got to fight to protect it. The problem that you guys are, are down here, you're experiencing what happened in the Northeast and the Mid Atlantic first. It's on a rebuilding trend. So you continue to lose access as it rebuilds with the promise that once it gets rebuilt, you're going to have access, but you never get that access back again. You get used to what you got. And then it keeps, keeps ratcheting back because the way the data collection is every year, then if you, you get to this rebuilt threshold, then they don't want it to go into the rebuilt. It's got to stay at that threshold. So it'll be the biggest snapper population you've ever seen in generations, yet you're never going to be able to dip below. It's always got to stay there. So data collection comes back and shows an anomaly. You guys overfished by 30%. Then you've got to pay that back on next year. It's, it's ridiculous. That's fan, and the reef, the artificial reefs that Mexico Beach been putting down has to oh, yeah, extremely help that. Oh, right? yeah. Bait, the bait sources there, the food source, source is there for them, so they're going to hang out year round. So for a lot of our viewers, you know, Mexico Beach is the extreme east end of Bay County. Right. A lot of times, you know, it doesn't even feel like you're in Bay County because it feels like you've come to a, a little oasis here in the Panhandle. Fantastic fishing. You guys have a pass. Can you tell us a little bit about how the season stacks up here in Mexico Beach? Yeah, starting in March, we start seeing our Spanish mackerel move in. We work them for a little while, then we get some sheep's head moving into the area. They're spawning out off of some of the local reefs, so we start targeting them. Mm -hmm. By the time May's rolling around, and or April, we're ling. Right. Um, ling, towards the end of April, we'll start seeing some king mackerel and that'll kind of carry us through May on some king mackerel in Spanish, uh, catch and release on red snapper. Right. Um, April 1st, you got your red grouper um, scamp. 
there in season all the way till February then, so we can target those offshore. And our fingers are crossed for a fall snapper season. Right? That's correct, yeah, fall snapper <laughs> season it would definitely help out too. And then as far as, you know, June 1st rolls around, then it's, you know, we get to catch our glorious red snapper. That's right, <laughs> <laughs> which we saw are glorious today. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're definitely plentiful. Oh yeah, they're, they're everywhere on the wrecks. So one last thing, and I know you got a lot to do. We got a, we got a big boat to clean. We got to refuel for tomorrow. But what's one tip you could give our viewers who are looking to come here, looking to go offshore? What's the one secret that you could, uh, could uh, let us know? As the season goes on, red snapper they do see a lot of you know a lot of baits in their face. So you probably want to lighten up on your leader, and maybe use some fluorocarbon. Right. Um, you know you're gonna. Maybe catch less fish, but the hookup ratio is going to be a lot better. Right, you may break some off, but the chances of, of catching more fish are... And bigger are, fish, you know, those skittish fish that you wouldn't normally catch on a 100-pound liter will eat on a, you know, 50 or 60-pound liter. Perfect. Well, thank you for taking us out today, and we appreciate it. Enjoyed it. All right, then, we'll check back with you later in the season. Appreciate it. Panama City living is simply better without glasses. The Eye Center of North Florida offers the most advanced surgeries, including lifestyle lens implants for cataract patients and custom view blade-free LASIK. Both procedures leave you with clear vision and in most cases, glasses free. The Eye Center of North Florida. Nine doctors, one vision. When you only have one shot, one chance, there are only two names to remember, Browning and C&G Sporting Goods. C&G carries the full line of Browning rifles, shotguns, handguns, knives, and clothing, like the Browning X-Boat. Every component of the Browning X-Boat works together to deliver the most critical feature, total accuracy. Visit C&G Sporting Goods today because you don't want to miss that one shot. The Captain Anderson makes fishing a breeze. There's a galley on board and your comfortable trip is all inclusive. Rod, reel, tackle, bait, and your fishing license. The traditional all day trip from seven to 5 p.m. Come aboard the Captain Anderson for a relaxing day of bottom fishing. There's plenty of room, so bring the whole family. It's a whopping big adventure and that's no fish tail. The Captain Anderson is located at Captain Anderson's Marina where the fish are always biting and the kids are always smiling. Please call for cruise schedules. Hey, Bay County Outdoors. Um, we're here with Pam Anderson at the historic Captain Anderson's Marina. Uh, it's a somewhat of a gloomy day today, uh, kind of fitting for the topic we're going to talk about. Um, last week, there was a lot of uh, new information released on Red Snapper. Yes. I don't think all of us um, really understand how we got to this point and what we can do moving forward. Um, you are one of our, our local experts at this topic. Um, I was wondering if you could share with the viewers what's happening and what measures we can take to, to help fight this. Okay. Well, um, there, there are two issues that can continue to be in front of us as recreational anglers, and that is the push for sector separation, which means dividing the recreational sector between charter boats, head boats, and private anglers. And the other, once they, uh, once the management gets catch shares, they want to uh, uh, appoint, you know, uh, catch, catch shares. Once they get the sector separation, they want right. to get catch shares. Okay, so what that means is, uh, in the fishery today, is they would say, okay, this many uh, fish, according to the overall quota, goes to charter boats, this many fish go to head boats, and this many fish go to uh, recreational anglers. And what they're headed for with recreational anglers is fish tags. Okay, well, we think that the whole scheme is wrong, and the, the reason we do is because they are very clear that they believe that they need to reduce the number of people who are fishing. And we think that we need to be growing the fishery right. to meet the demands of the communities. And that's why we have the Bay County Artificial Reef Association, Emerald Coast Reef Association, Mexico Beach you right. know, Artificial Reef Association. So we are trying to rebuild the fishery, and we are, and that's very evident with what you're seeing being caught out there. But, but this push continues by NOAA management. And so um, this, uh, what happened this last week is um, the, there was a court ruling, the commercial fishermen and um, three charter boat operators, one, one is actually here in town, there's an environmental defense fund, took NOAA 
and CCA, a recreational organization, to court saying that we had caught too many fish and we are over overfishing our allowance. And according to the numbers, we are, right. but we believe that the data needs to be checked and investigated because we, we believe that there are some issues that are very questionable in that data. So, um, so because of that ruling last, uh, you know, two weeks ago, the, um, uh, the Gulf Council last week said, well, we have to do what the judge says. So what he, what he determined, or they determined from that ruling was they had to add accountability measures, which means they're going to, uh, if we overfish in the future, we are going to have to uh, have a quota taken away the, year, the next year. If, uh, if we overfish, they think that we're overfishing during the season, they're going to cut the season off before you know it ends according so, to the number of days. So we really days. can't plan at this point. We I mean, can't plan. Right. And, um, and that, that all plays into reducing participation in the fishery. Right. People, they know that people are frustrated, they've got boats, they want to go out and, uh, and catch the red snapper. They, there are plenty of them out there. But the more the frustration comes, you know, more and more people are saying, you know, I, uh, this is a very expensive hobby, and I, you right. know, I don't know whether this is worth it anymore. And that's the intent. And then the troubling thing about that for residents of Bay County or any of the Gulf states, the economic impact of Red Snapper, not just on, on charter boats or head boats, mm -hmm. but on the local businesses, is Absolutely. tremendous. And I don't think that's being uh, realized when, when you know, Noah's looking at what this does to our community. Right, and actually the recreational fishery alone in Florida is a five billion dollar industry. Ninety-four thousand jobs depend on the recreational fishery. And 39 percent of that money comes in from out of state, right. so it affects our tourism. So it's very important uh, to the coastal communities to uh, continue providing the fish that the customers right. want, you know, to, um, uh, to you know, continue fishing and uh, to keep on you know, uh, helping our tourism uh, dollars you know, stretch and so forth. So, so what, besides the accountability measures, um, they said that um, because we, in this ruling, because uh, we had overfished for four of the last five years by two million pounds a year, uh, that, that they were going to deduct that from uh, this year's and next year's um, recreational quota. Right. So that's how we got to 11 days instead of 40 days. I guess the hardest thing, and, and where we get most of the questions at Bay County Outdoors, especially emails from, from readers, when you go out in the Gulf, if you're looking for red grouper, or looking for any other bottom species, you right. cannot get your bait through the snapper. That's correct. Um, we went out in Mexico Beach and we were looking for red grouper and we had, we had you know, really big red snapper schooling around the boat that came up from 100 foot of water. Right. The, you know, so for, for a recreational, how, I guess if you could help explain, you know, we're seeing more snapper than we've ever seen. Right. How are they coming up with the numbers saying that these, that we're, we're overfishing? Okay, the term overfishing means we are catching more pounds of fish than, uh, than what the regulators wanted us to catch. Okay, according to the Magnuson uh, law, the, we are not supposed to overfish a certain limit. Well, the limit is way up here, and the, uh, and the accountability measures are way down here. If we overfish this level, then they, call it, they say that we're overfishing, okay? And this is where the law says we need to be. But if we go over this amount, it's right. when, when they say we're overfishing and that we need to pay back or have accountability measures or whatever. Okay, there's one thing that people don't understand, and this is uh, this is hard to explain, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, I'll do my best. Okay, in 2006, our uh, we had a six-month season, four fish bag limit. The average fish uh, weighed 3.2 pounds. Okay, so with with that, we were able to harvest. 1.4 million fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, today, with the, about the same uh, or a little bit more uh, quota in pounds, we're only harvesting between 525 and 550 thousand fish. Okay, so we're we're harvesting a third the number of fish. 
I've asked Noah about this, Noah in Washington, and they've said, this is the way we do things. And I said, well, you're not giving the recreational anglers credit for the million fish that they've left in the water since 2006. And, that's, and so that is unreasonable. And that's, they said, that is the way we do things, and that is how we're going to continue doing things. And that is, to me, the problem. So Pam, with this information, what are we doing in the short term? What can we do in the long term to fix this problem? Okay, the, in the short term, uh, the Gulf Council has determined to you know, cut back to the 11 day season. Right. Okay, they, uh, they put those new accountability measures in place, so we will be punished for, uh, for overfishing if we take more fish in that 11 days than they wanted us to take. Um, a, and then another issue that has come up since the Gulf Council meeting, actually the day after the Gulf Council meeting, was Louisiana uh, decided they only have a three mile limit, so they don't get out very far and don't catch many red snapper in state waters. But they decided to go from an 88 day state season to a 365 day state season. And so Dr. Crabtree said on Friday in one of our conference calls, that that may change our 11-day season. And uh, they said that uh, NOAA, our uh, NAMPS would have to look at that. And if Florida and, does the same thing, that again okay. could also impact the federal yes, season. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay, and the people who get hurt in this, and, and Dr. Crabtree knows this, and he's very aware of it, and the reason why he instituted Amendment 30B in the law, you'll hear a lot of folks in the charter industry talk about Amendment 30B. That prevents us from fishing in state waters when state waters are open and federal waters are closed. So, so what that relates to is we have 11 days, all these boats have 11 days of profitability right. out of the year. And the rest of the days, they will, be, um, they will be taking folks out. They have lots of fun. They, have, they catch lots of fish, but they're not catching the fish that they want to catch, right. except for the catch and release. And we are catching a lot of snapper, just like you said. And, uh, and so we will catch and release those fish. We'll put up information on how to get in touch with uh, the Recreational Fishing Alliance if, if you'd like to join and help the fight. And Pam, um, on behalf of everybody in Bay County, I want to thank you for being on the oh, front lines. I know absolutely. you put a lot of work into this, and uh, you continue to put a lot of work into it. So uh, I hope everyone gets behind you and gets well, behind this, you. this issue. Thank and you. We've been um, we've been taking passengers for hire since 1920, and uh, we'd like to continue yep, that yes, uh, that tradition. And uh, we uh, we want we know that we're going to continue fishing, whether we have red snapper or not. And uh, and folks are. Um, going to have a good time with their families, That's right. yes, it whether, will. <laughs> whether we have snapper or not, but, uh, but we want to get their snapper back. Yeah, great. Thank you, Pam. Okay, thank you. For everything you need on or off the water, visit the Panama City and St. Andrews Marinas. Both locations provide you with easy access boat slips, ramps, fuel, bait, and tackle. Come visit our ship stores and see our unique nautical gifts and clothing. Or just relax with a cool drink and grab a snack while watching the boats come in. Don't forget that Mariner on your shopping list. Come by and see our unique nautical gifts, cards, and clothing at the ship store at Panama City or St. Andrews Marina. Panama City and St. Andrews Marinas. Everything you remember and so much more. Sunjammers and Hobie Kayak provide the ultimate lightweight fishing platforms that will offer anyone what they need when it comes time to hit the water. Hobie Kayak's commitment to innovation, quality, and owner satisfaction is unparalleled in the industry, and the service and selection provided by Sunjammers Water Sports is top notch. So when it's time for you to go kayak fishing, there's only two names you need to remember, Sunjammers Water Sports and Hobie Kayaks. Sunjammers Water Sports is located on the west end of Panama City Beach and online at sunjammers.com. Hi, I'm Matt Smith with PanamaCityInshore.com and today I'm going to show you a knot that I use a lot that I think is very versatile for all different pound test sizes and is something that every angler should know specifically for artificial lures. It's called the perfection loop. different loop knots out 
that you can learn. This one I think is the most versatile and one of the things that makes it unique is that you're able to adjust the size of your loop depending on your, your lure, your hook, whatever your presentation is, and that's a big deal. Uh, it's really simple. Got a piece of 80 pound test here, hopefully enable you to see it. Take your main line and you're just going to make a simple overhand loop. Once you've got your simple overhand loop, you're gonna take your plug, and, and what I do a lot of times with this is I'm actually trying to do away and get away from a split ring. Split rings just most of the time are just uh, unnecessary and affect the action of the bait. So I'm gonna take my end of my line. Now I've got the overhand loop in front of the bait. I'm gonna run the tag end through the loop and then come over the main line. Once I have the once I have the line run through the loop and over the main line, I'm going to pull down the loop that's attached to the bait and I'm going to take the tag end through that loop, through the big loop. So now I've got a inside loop inside of the large loop and then I'm going to come over that one and back down through the bottom. This is a knot that you really need to practice to get the hang of. Once you do, you can do it with your eyes closed. It seems a little complex at first. Like any knot, I'm going to wet it, and then I'm going to cinch it down. And like I say, I can adjust from here. I can adjust the size of my loop. The nice thing about this one is you know it's tied perfect when this tag end comes out perfectly at 90 degrees perpendicular. If it comes out in another direction, you're, you're off, and it's not a hard knot to mess up when you're still trying to learn it. And that's it. And that allows that bait, trim your tag end off pretty short, and that allows that bait full range of movement, very natural, no hardware to weigh the nose down, and it's just something every angler needs to know. How you doing? I'm Nathan Cheneau with your uh, Bay County Outdoors Fishing Report for the week. With trout and redfish, you're going to want to look on the grass flats, especially on grass flats that only come off about 50 feet from shore and then drop off to a nice deep ledge. A lot of those fish have been actually running on the ledges, but they'll move up onto the grass to feed. We've got a lot of pompano running around on these shallow sand flats just inside the inlet. We've been catching them on both bucktail and rubber tail jigs flounder are starting to move back in. We've been seeing more and more and more flounder over the uh, last week or so, so be out looking for those in uh, any kind of nice deep sandy potholes on the flats or these big long ledges on the outside of the flats are going to be good places for these flounder to move up. For your full in-depth fishing report, check us out at uh, baycountyoutdoors.com. And don't forget to like us on Facebook.